Well, good morning. Greetings to the Brookings audience, to those of you here in the Falk Auditorium and those online. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Melanie Sisson. I'm a fellow in the Strobe Talbot Center for Security Strategy and Technology here at Brookings. And I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome to the Brookings stage the 23rd Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. General Alvin, it is a real pleasure to have you. The entire Brookings community has been very much looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you very much. And, and Melanie, when you said, it's still, I still have that, so was asked how you like being the Chief of Staff. I said, I still have that sort of new job smell on me. Because mm -hmm. when you hearing that the 23rd Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force is still, it's quite humbling. Uh, so I'm, I'm honored to be in this position at this time, because many people might have heard me say in a couple of my previous speeches that I do believe we're in a time of consequence. And the things that we do now are going to ripple forward into the future. Uh, so I'm humbled, um, but at the same time I'm excited because some of the things that we're in, we are going to execute and we are contemplating now are things I've been thinking about for about a decade uh, over that when I was working for General Welsh as his chief strategist a long time ago. So having some of these ideas start to come to fruition, I think now is the time when we start to put them into action and really follow through, and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that, and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation to be able to, to discuss this in more depth. Well, that's wonderful, and I know you're very eager to get into the substance, but you did mention your past a bit, and you have had a very long and distinguished career in the Air Force. And so um, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about your path and, in particular, any lessons that you may have learned along the way through trial and error or success or failure or certainly any practices that you've acquired um, that you're now intentionally bringing into your work as chief? Well, I'm still a work in progress. I think we all are. Uh, and if you looked at my career, I uh, refer to myself um, sort of affectionately as a mutt because I didn't really follow a, a one true career path. I started off, uh, you know, actually was, my first assignment was flying C-12s in Europe in the late 80s. So I was able to witness the fall of the Berlin Wall and see there a stark change in environment happening from a Cold War era to suddenly the end of history. And watching our nation and our Air Force adapt to that, I always wanted to be a test pilot. And I had uh, one of my senior officers say, but you have a great career here in air mobility. Why would you want to be a test pilot? I don't want to be a test pilot. I'd like to be an astronaut. So that was an, an area where I went into a non-standard career, went to be a test pilot, found my way back through the School of Advanced Air Studies, Air and Space Power Studies, to be back in the operational community. And I sort of bounced around. But what I learned along the way was that there's not a single path. Um, I never would have thought that this would have been a path to put me here on the stage talking to you this morning. But I think what I've learned is, you know, when you follow your passion and you try and be good at what you are and you listen more than you talk, the whole two ears and one mouth thing actually means something. I've learned a lot from the people that I've been uh, associated with that are different specialties, different career fields. And sometimes when you're, when you're humble enough to be smart enough to know how dumb you are, you can get smarter quicker. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for indulging that question, and it's uh, very heartening for all the mutts out there to, <laughs> to see you uh, here in your current position. And so, so now um, we can certainly do what I know that you came here to do, which is to get wonky. Um, <laughs> uh, you uh, re recently announced that the Air Force is re-optimizing for great power competition, uh, and that it will be an extensive effort that makes sweeping changes. So let's start a little bit at the beginning, if we could, please. Um, what is the Air Force currently optimized for? Well, thank you for that question. I think it, a lot of the press that people have seen, and, and we've been talking very quickly about the what, but I really want to spend a little more time about the why. Uh, and your point is, is a good one to, to feed into that, because if you look at the way that we project power, the way that we make our capability development decisions, it really, we're optimized for the environment that we have adapted to over the past 20 years. Uh, we're optimized to be able to provide forces of any size or scale uh, largely to the Middle East, uh, in areas where we have uh, uncontested access to our bases there, and we can deploy in the way that we always have. Uh, but as we look at the change in the strategic environment, that's where we see that perhaps we're not optimized for the right environment. And if I could dig down a little bit on that. Um, when we introduced, Secretary Kendall introduced these things called operational imperatives a couple years ago. It was designed to really get after some of the modernization that we needed in order to be able to advance and meet the pacing challenge for modern warfare. That was on a modernization initiative. That's about the stuff. That's about the capabilities we need. 
But at the same time, there were some sensors out there that were saying maybe our institution also need a little bit of tweaking. When we look at the, the pacing challenge and the threats that are advancing against us, those capabilities that we're developing other right capabilities. But if we have an institution that doesn't know how to best wield those in the way that we are organized, in the way that we project power, uh, then we're not optimized for that particular environment. So when we put together this program, this reoptimization program, we started with, do we have a problem? And that's where we, we assess that we are really optimized for an era that is bypassing us. It still exists. There are still threats around the world, but the most pacing threat, the one that could have more of an existential impact on our nation and our way of life is one we need to get optimized for. And so we started with a fairly defensible methodology. And the first one was, what are the characteristics of this environment that we find ourselves, this strategic environment? And as I said, one of them is a, 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 a power that has great ambitions, that wants to uh, advance their capabilities and capacities in a way that might threaten our nation. That's, we haven't seen that since the Cold War. Rapid advances in technology. Uh, a digital world, digital designs versus analog, uh, computing power through the roof, um, advancing domains like cyber and space that are becoming more and more integral to national security and national defense, um, and a constantly downward fiscal pressure. Those are things, that's the environment. So if you look at what the environment is that we find ourselves in, then you say, okay, if you were going to build a Department of Air Force from scratch, what were the attributes you'd want in that Department of Air Force, or the Air Force to adapt to that environment? And you come up with things like strong organizational alignment to be able to make decisions at the speed of change. You come up with agility and adaptability so when new technologies and new opportunities come, you can seize them rather than contemplate them as they go by. You want organizational alignment to ensure that you can make enterprise solutions rather than solutions in, in one part or, one, uh, or another part of the organization. You want a mission over function focus. So understand what's the best for a true single Air Force design rather than parts of the Air Force. So we stacked a few of those together, and then we said, how are we doing? And based on that, that's how we came up with these four areas within which we want to have uh, our Air Force reoptimized uh, for, within the areas of developing people, developing capabilities, generating readiness, and projecting power. But that was how we came up with the methodology to get after this program. So you mentioned um, that internal to that, the, the phrase you used was not function-focused, but mission-focused. Yeah. There was another phrase um, in the Air Force materials um, on, on this sweeping set of changes, and that you want the Air Force to better be able to see itself. Yeah. What does that mean? It, it's great that you put those two together, because they really are two sides of the same coin. Uh, when we talk about mission over function, uh, our Air Force has many of our major commands. We have... We have asked those commanders to focus on the readiness of their part of the Air Force. So if it's Air Combat Command, it's largely with the Fighter Force. When it's Global Strike Command, it's with the Bomber Force, et cetera. When we're asking them to focus on their readiness, but at the same time, we're asking them to um, help develop the future of that particular functional part of our Air Force, next generation air dominance, you know, F-22 modernization, those sort of things then what we're actually asking that commander to do is to make internal trades between today and tomorrow, but only within that functional part of the Air Force. And if you do that in the different sections across the Air Force, you have an Air Force that is optimized in those areas, but not optimized for the whole Air Force. And so therefore, as you're trying to adapt to an environment where you might have to deploy your forces differently, project your power more rapidly, more coherently, in a more complex and dynamic environment, you may not know how well you can do that. And that is why this idea of being able to see ourselves, once we understand how we intend to project power, then we understand the capacity to do that, and we can see how much Air Force we really have and how ready that Air Force is for the environment that we might have to face in this era of great power competition. And what is the relationship between those changes and those um, conceptual adjustments? What's the relationship between that reoptimization and the concept of global integration? Well, actually, it's a, they marry up quite nicely because in order for us to have global integration uh, across not only several combatant commands, but also across all of the joint force, the rest of the joint force also needs to know what they're getting as well. They also need to understand how the Air Force is going to integrate into that joint force, what types of capabilities, what is our concept of operations, what is our capacity that we bring. And so to do that, we have to have our own 
internally the United States Air Force, and of course this is across the Department of Air Force, so if my brother Salty Saltzman mm -hmm. was here, he'd be talking about the Space Force as well, which is playing uh, an increasing role in our national defense. But we need to be able to have that coherent units of action, set of readiness, uh, a, a concept of operations to deploy, engage, and sustain combat operations. We need to be able to have that explainable to ourselves, to our joint partners across the combatant commands, and to our allies and partners as well. And you, you just mentioned um, allies and partners. What are the implications of this reoptimization for those allies and partners? It's a great question. We've had that a lot, and, and I don't know if the answer is going to be disappointing or reassuring, but it's not going to be that drastic of a difference. I'm hoping when we get at the other side of this, the only real difference the allies and partners are going to see is they're also going to see what units are, are more going to be um, sort of representative of what might happen if we actually have to go into combat. And they'll be able to under, understand how we can fit in and integrate with them better because we have a more holistic, trained, and ready United States Air Force. And to be clear, it's not just changes. It's the introduction of new things. Yes. There's sort of many establish, establishment clauses, yes. so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. I, I think um, internal to our Air Force... Uh, they are uh, pretty large changes in some areas. But I think as we, the, the lead up to this announcement that we had a couple weeks ago had with it um, uh, lots of um, maybe imaginations gone wild about what it was and what it wasn't going to be. But I, I think the, what you're really going to see is internal to our Air Force, airmen will still be, uh, they'll be doing just different work. They'll be uh, in different organizations. And I, I'll, I'll, let me take, for example, one of the big things that I think is going to happen uh, that we're moving forward on is this thing called this Integrated Capabilities Command. So as we talk about how we develop capabilities for the future, again, I, as I mentioned, sometimes those are developed partially within the major commands, but they're developed in pieces. And so one of the changes that we're going we're gonna to undertake is to set up a single command that takes those futures and the future requirements um, missions from each of the major commands and centralizes them, puts that in one area where it understands the impacts of modernizing one part of our Air Force with the other part of our Air Force. And it helps us devel develop a more cohesive and coherent um, force design into the future. And so externally, you may not really notice that that much, but internally, there will be di different roles and missions that are scattered throughout the Air Force. But again, it's under the theme of taking a somewhat fractionated and functional uh, optimized Air Force to be a more integrated. You're seeing that a lot in these, in a lot of the initiatives, is you're seeing the word integrated, integrating, because with the pace of change, again, we're going back to the characteristics of the environment. We have to be able to make quality decisions faster. And sometimes when you diffuse the power structures and the decision-making authorities across the functions, it's very hard to get an enterprise solution on time. Mm -hmm. And so those internal to the Air Force are where you're going to see a lot of those changes. Mm -hmm. And has the Air Force ever undergone um, this extent or magnitude of change in its history before? Historical comparisons are always dangerous, aren't they? <laughs> Not as dangerous uh, as I, predicting the future. That's but, exactly. Yeah. Yogi Berra would agree with you <laughs> on right. that. But I think um, that remains to be seen. Uh, I, I, I was contemplating this the other day when we think about magnitudes of change. Um, you know, I think the last time we did something that people recognize along these lines was really when, when General McPeak changed the way we had some of the command structures here and there. And it was just a different way of organizing. And some of that was, again, optimizing for the environment that we found ourselves. Remember, General McPeak was the chief of staff right after the Cold War. And he was in this time of change when it was a massive reduction. And so the Air Force had to solve for efficiency. And so trying to do that in a way that was most efficient against, if we take ourselves back to the early 90s, remember, that was the end of history. We didn't really have another major power to go against. We, we used air power for more sort of um, coercion and to support national defense objectives, but not against the threat like we have now. So that was probably the last time we had something similar to this. Um, but I think, again, it was adapting to the environment within which we found ourselves. Yeah. And do you think that you have everything resident within the Air Force today that you need to implement these changes? I think we have the large bulk of it. You know, it, it's an interesting uh, conversation that we have with stakeholders, and Congress being one of the key stakeholders that we engage with, uh, because we know the direction we're heading. And this is another part of This is another attribute that I think we need to embrace moving forward. All of us do in the 21st century is this idea of, of solving for agility. You know, we don't know exactly what the precise end state is going to be. So this, in, this integrated capabilities command, I can't tell you 
to the airmen exactly how many are going to be there. But we also can't wait for that in order to get started. We need to solve for agility. We need to know that we're going to move forward and adapt on the fly. And when you do that, you can engage more stakeholders who can help you get to the right solution. As of right now, we do not anticipate this to be a, a large fiscal burden. But to say that this will be without cost is it, it, fairly naive. I mean, you want to change the name on a sign, it costs some money. But the idea that we are going to do something that is, is massively going to impact an already fiscally constrained and pressurized budget, our attempt is going to be not to do that. How we can do that, how we engage Congress, how we engage stakeholders, how we look internally to our Air Force in different ways to accomplish this that aren't fiscally intensive is going to be key to this, which is why it may be unsatisfying to some because we're rolling this out without having the actual signed official document of what the end state looks like. But I do believe in my heart that that is something we need to embrace as an institution and as a government to be able to solve for agility. Don't confuse precision, which we can do very easily, with accuracy. It's not the same thing. But if you know you're heading in the right direction, you can learn along the way, you get to a better destination. So you mentioned agility. Can you refresh us, please, on agile combat employment and give us the, the picture of what that is? Well, it, it's a great point because it's, it really talks about how we intend to, to project power. You know, we had uh, decades of being able to do the American way of war in which what air power did is we would project our forces into theater in an uncontested environment at a time and pace of our choosing. We would build up our forces and then be able to roll back air defenses of the adversary, establish and sustain air superiority in order to maintain an unfair fight like we like for a combined arms fight uh, on, in, in all domains. That's the way we did it before. Now we're in a different environment where that what was uncontested at increasing ranges is requiring us to operate differently. So when we say agile combat employment, this is where we, if we're going to operate in that contested environment, we need to be able to move in an agile manner, to move within the theater, to be able to disaggregate for survival, but aggregate for the greatest combat effect. That's a different way of war fighting. That's a different type of force you need to project in order to go in a somewhat austere field, not totally austere, but we have this sort of hub and spoke uh, arrangement where you have a, a main base and then you would be able to diffuse around the, the theater, but it allows you to be more dynamic and adapt to the threat as it's unwinding faster and faster, the war is unwinding faster and faster. This requires a different, a different mindset for airmen, and that's what agile combat employment is about, and that's what we need to optimize our training and power projection for. And so is, is that vision that you've just described it, predominantly what the reoptimized Air Force will provide the joint force in a near-peer conflict? It is. In, in, in the near term, I should also describe uh, over the time horizon when we talk about uh, this, this great power competition piece. There's really two time horizons. The one is to take the forces that we have right now and make sure they are as ready as possible today as soon as we can to, to ensure that we are ready for the fight that, that could unfold. We hope never, but it could be sooner than, than some anticipate. So that's the first part, and that is really how we're projecting power and how we're generating readiness. And that goes along the lines of what we're going to provide to the joint force, uh, agile combat employment and the like. But the other piece that I talked about, this how we're developing our people and how we're developing capabilities, it's really adapting our institution to be able to be more conducive to the environment, which is a more fast-paced, rapid, where, where opportunities come and go faster, and you can't be operating at a 20th century bureaucratic pace when you have a 21st century dynamic environment. So it's about both. The first part, as you mentioned, was about to the joint force being able to project power and have readiness for that. But we also want to make sure we can develop capabilities in our people to win another long-term competition. Um, I have another question about Agile Combat Employment that was submitted um, ahead of time. We appreciate that our Brookings audience does provide some questions um, ahead, not just during. And this one comes from a youthful scholar named Michael O'Hanlon. And his question <laughs> is... Is he new? Is he I don't, I, you may not have <laughs> be familiar with him, but uh, his, his question is, is the Agile Combat Employment concept and the contingency access to several sites in the Philippines and perhaps one or two other places now enough for hypothetical warfighting contingencies? I like the fact that you put hypothetical in there. <laughs> Because one never knows till you actually get to the actual combat. But the concept, we believe, is the right concept. 
and it is the because it allows us the opportunity to also not only just fight outside of the contested environment, but we have allies and partners in other countries who have an interest in a free and open Indo-Pacific in this particular case. And so the ability to show that we can operate in and with them to the extent that their nations, their sovereign nations, enable access, uh, basing and overflight, that we are able to do that in a manner where we can project power from afar and also within, so we can show that we have the assurance and the so cooperation with the allies and partners for which we have common cause and common values for free and open Indo-Pacific. So I believe that this enables us to be able to fight with inside and outside what we're calling the contested environment to the extent that uh, our allies and partners are, are with us. Can I draw that out a little bit? We've talked, you, you spoke before about um, reoptimization brings to uh, combat. What does it bring to competition? What is, what is the role of the Air Force, and what does it provide to the Joint Force in competition? Well, frankly, I, on, on one side, it's the, uh, on the, let's talk about the developing people side as well. Um, we, I believe that the manner in which we develop our force and get the skill sets that we need to be able to leverage advanced technology, uh, human machine teaming, all those things that I believe are gonna be part and parcel to a future Air Force, uh, getting the talent in place, the incentives to retain that talent, the force that's developed to be able to leverage all these capabilities is going to be key to be able to, uh, to leverage all the technologies and stay ahead of the competitors to where that's deterrence. When they see you're developing the capabilities and you have the, not only the, the, the stuff, but you have the airmen who know how to operate that and can stay ahead, that works that is right in the competition space, as well as the capability development. When we have opportunities such as I think one of the more exciting ones now that I'm personally excited about is our collaborative combat aircraft. This idea of being able to get affordable mass and leveraging technologies and leveraging industry in new ways, uh, that I think is right part and parcel with the competition piece. But if we don't have an institution that knows how to grab those technologies, grab those ideas, understand the value to the whole Air Force, figure out which ones to integrate and which ones to maybe set aside so we don't have sunk costs for bad things, that, I think, is part and parcel to the competition part of great power competition. You, you know, you, um, you just mentioned sort of an AI-enabled technology and an approach to using it. Um, are there others that you're watching, whether it be from sort of the back office kinds of applications of AI-enabled technologies all the way through to the more directly warfighting capabilities that you think have special potential? I think it's exciting. I, I, I think, for one part, it's, it doesn't mean that we're going to have a, an, an Air Force of robots now or in the future. Uh, you know, warfare and, and national defense is a human endeavor. But the idea that we can leverage the thing that machines can do uh, to enable them to do that to max extent possible, to let us do what we can do as humans, I think is, I wouldn't say it's untapped, it's lightly tapped right now, but it has so much potential in the future from the business systems that help us to make everyday decisions better to those AI-enabled algorithms that are developed that enable us to develop situational awareness and decision speed. It's interesting, if you, if you sort of fast forward into the future and you start thinking about the algorithms that help get situational awareness that make one side make a decision faster than the other, it's a fascinating thought experiment. And actually, for those of you who are as old as me who remember the, the, the movie War Games, when they have that and finally say the only way to win is not to play. It's an interesting thing that how algorithms will play in decision makers of senior leaders because that's really where it's going to happen. I think that's one part. But on the actual warfighting front, one of the things we're doing that's exciting, I think, is as we're developing these collaborative combat aircraft, we're not doing it in a 20th century way where you develop the platform and you say, hey, look, this can be autonomous. You get the platform, you start experimenting on that with... Uh, autonomy capabilities, and then afterwards you go, I think we're going to buy that. And then you say, hmm, how are we going to base it? How are we going to train with it? And you do it in sort of a linear fashion. We're doing those all at once. So at the same time, we're looking at the platforms. We're also developing right now, looking at experimenting at what the autonomy can and can't do to help shape how we would use that. And at the same time, we're having an experimental operations unit to understand how one might leverage that and integrate it into our Air Force. So those sort of things, are they're coming at us very fast. AI-enabled technology and autonomy certainly aren't going to replace, but the one that augments them and the one that masters the human-machine teaming, I think is going to have a critical advantage going forward in warfare. And what you've just described, um, the emphasis not just on the platform, is this, I believe, in the materials, and forgive my memory if, if it's not, um, the difference between you know, focusing on the platform versus units of action, I believe it was? 
is I, I think one distinction I'd like to draw is really platforms versus the system. So when we think about the way that we built our Air Force, we built our Air Force in the past, and I'll go, I'm going to the extreme to make the case, but we build platforms. And then on those platforms, we say, this platform needs to do this mission. So what do I need on this platform? Well, it needs to have certain characteristics, outer mold line to have certain, you know, stealthy characteristics, low observability, whatever. Hmm. It also needs a radar. It also maybe needs some electronic warfare on it. It also needs some ability to communicate. It also has to integrate the weapons on it. So we, we put the mission systems and we optimize for that platform. Okay, what a fantastic platform we have. Wait a minute, this platform also needs to communicate and integrate with that platform and that other system. And so we have built so the platforms, put the mission systems on them, and then tried to tie them and stitch them together with all the other ones. Well, that makes it very difficult if you want to advance at the pace of technological change because now you've got to untie all those knots and figure out how you make if you go platform-centric. But if you start off saying, these are, the, these are the core principles, traits, and characteristics of these mission systems that we have. And as you develop and design your platforms, you need to ensure that they are adaptable to this particular set of mission systems. And then you can update the mission systems at the pace of coding and when that happens, if you know automatically you have built in the platforms that can integrate with that, you can move faster. And so thinking about the future of our Air Force as starting with the systems approach, system-centric around which platforms adapt rather than vice versa, is a way that you can keep up with the speed of, uh, of change. And I think that's going to be key going forward as well. We hear a lot about um, the changing character of war, and you described a little bit about what, it, you know, what it's changing from and what it's changing to. And... I presume that a lot of what I'm about to ask is actually resident in the changes that you're making. But for where we are today, um, what is your sense of how well the Air Force is doing in terms of developing operational concepts um, that address those changes in the character of war? I'm actually quite proud of our Air Force. And in fact, the, uh, um, the development of the, you may have heard of the joint war fighting concept as well, which is relatively new. Also quite proud of that. I think we are integrated in, in a way that really recognizes uh, where the sort of skating to the, where the puck is going to be, rather than where we've been. And I think the, there are some key elements in the joint warfighting concept that the Air Force future operating concept aligns very well with. And it is along those lines of, of, of speed and tempo and agility. And the way that we have done business in the past, like I said, we, we no longer, it's, it's, it's cost prohibitive to be able to say that we're going to build enough Air Force to do it the way we did before and have air superiority for days and weeks on end. That's probably not affordable. It's also not necessary. If we think about understanding and synchronizing when you need that air superiority, that domain control for a certain period of time, well, you can only have that if you can synchronize and coordinate with the other elements across the joint force uh, to, again, aggregate, have that combat effect, have that positive effect, and then be able to disaggregate and, sur and survive. Those concepts are, are very coherent with each other. And I think moving forward, the change in character war is driving us to more synchronization across the joint force, more agility and speed. And those sort of things are starting to manifest themselves, not only in the Air Force, but across the joint force. Well, so this is um, an extensive program uh, that you've initiated and are continuing to, to inform everybody about. We've already acknowledged the Yogi Berra uh, caveat on all of these things. But when you think forward, um, how long do you think that this will take? I like the laughter in the audience because it's my internal monologue saying the same thing. Um, it, it, it will come in stages. I believe that uh, there will be parts of this, particularly on the um, developing people part, that we will be able to, to get rolling fairly quickly. And so that part, elevating Air Education and Training Command to Airman Development Command. Uh, I would really, we're really trying to get this Integrated Capabilities Command as soon as possible because the sooner we start that, the sooner we can start changing the way that we build our, our POMs and our budgets and developing the future force. So the, the way of not sidestepping the answer, uh, I believe that there will be pieces that will be developed. I, I anticipate if you look five years in the future. I'm only going to be able to do this for four years as long as I can keep my job, but it's all I'm going to be doing. It's the thing I'm going to do from start to finish. So I don't know that it will be fully done by the time I complete mine, but I, I would hope that at that point we will see um, a, a different enough Air Force where you can say, ah, 
it's, I see where we are now versus where we were back in 2024 when we announced these. Um, and I think those, they're going to come in pieces, uh, but I think probably in the next, by, by four years from now, if I do my job and I get the support and I'm able to build the team and build the advocacy, uh, you're going to see a, a drastically changed Air Force, I think. Well, you've highlighted the importance of developing people. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a, a number of audience questions come in prior about recruitment and retention. Yeah. So if you'd offer some thoughts on those, please. It's actually a, an improving story. I, 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 I sort of lowered my voice as I said that because I'm <laughs> cautiously optimistic because you never really know. It's, a, it's an interesting environment within which we find ourselves. But there are some things that we've done over the last 18 months within the United States Air Force that were frankly practical. And I don't know whether they're overdue, but they were due. And these included uh, looking at some of our policies and understanding where maybe we were overly prescriptive. I mean, I'm not sure that you could tell whether uh, someone has a tattoo here or here if that's going to be prejudicial to good order and discipline, for example. So some of those, are, we should probably ch we changed those a little bit. We changed uh, some of the other policies that we had with respect to restrictions to, uh, to body fat measurement for those coming who are applying have the same standard when you're in the Air Force, the same standard. And by relaxing that to meet what the other services were doing, we were able to increase our number of recruits by almost 4,000. And we're also longitudinally tracking that to ensure that they're able to maintain the fitness. And so far, so good. So some of those were really working hard on that. That's sort of the, to solve the bathtub now. But I think for the long term, I think the long term is, is communicating better and, and really advocating what it means to be in the United States Air Force. This idea of having a sense of purpose, of, of having something where you join a winning team. I think airmen just need to, Americans who are interested, just need to get that message and understand what the real value proposition of being in the United States Air Force. This year, knock wood, we think we're on path on the active duty side to, to make our recruiting goals. Uh, the Air Force Reserve is very close. The Air National Guard we're still working on, but everyone is doing better than we were last year. So I wouldn't have called it a crisis, but it's something that we need to make sure we never take our eyes off. Yeah. So, you know, bringing new uh, personnel onto that team, they'll be entering into this effort to re-optimize the Air Force, and the folks that are staying are, are embedded in that effort as well. What has been the response, the reaction, the feedback? I know it's early days still, but in terms of beginning to socialize and introduce these changes, what have, have you heard back? It's interesting because you can almost uh, separate it out by different strata in our Air Force. So the newest airmen, they're already getting some of this uh, more you know, mission-ready airmen-focused training in basic military training and in the tech schools. So we're starting that already. So they're coming into our Air Force with a little better understanding, orienting towards this great power competition. So for that younger cohort, I think they're like, okay, but this is what I, this is what I heard in basic, but let's keep going. Um, the next strata up, I think, is one that's been hungering for change, that, that knew that something was out there that needed to be changed. Now they're sort of looking, is this it? Is this, is this? So I think they're very open to it as well. Um, and this is, I'm going to characterize, and, I, and not pejoratively at all, because this is human behavior right here. Those in the middle, they understood the Air Force that got them to where they are. And they understood the path. And now if that path looks like it's going to be altered, there's some unease there. So our job is to communicate with those airmen to say, there's still a fantastic path for a future for you. It might be altered from what you thought, but it's just as robust and it's just as important. So there is that natural, they call it a frozen middle for a reason. There's this natural skepticism that we have some work to do. I think at the senior leader level, uh, it's, th there's this awareness and this sort of, after this introspection, this idea that we're on the right path. So I would say at the top and at the bottom, there's energy and there's advocacy. The convincing has to be in the middle. And I understand that. I, I was there before. So I think that's the job to do internally. Well, I have a couple of specific, um, more pointed audience questions to put to you. And the first one is, how are plans to defend Guam and even Okinawa in the event of war going? Ah. <laughs> that, that is a very specific question. It is. <laughs> work, work in progress because, again, as, at this classification level, we always have to look at what we thought about five years ago and then look at are there increasing capabilities that make those less um, relevant or less successful in the future. 
that the Department of Defense has you know, really pointed focus specifically on Guam, understanding the nature of the capabilities we have there, and has really elevated that across the Department of Defense. I think that's another area where we have each of our individual services working there, and it's been it's been wanting in the past for some sort of a coherent overall approach to it. And the and the OSD and Department of Defense leadership, you know, has applied that sort of oversight and integration across there. So I would say it's. Um, it's progressing, and it's an open question of how fast we can get there, as well as um, there's, there's a lot that needs to be done on the infrastructure, and sometimes you can only build so fast and so well, so getting that right, I think, is gonna be hugely important, but the, I would say the attention and focus based on the, the so the, the rightful pressure from Indopaycom and others has really brought the, that attention. I think it's accelerating. Another in a different part of the world. Um, what are the lessons of the Russia-Ukraine war for the use of air power in future war? It's interesting because I also want to be humble about that to presume that we know the lessons right now when it's still ongoing. But I will say one thing. It was interesting after the first six months or nine months in, into the year, um, uh, we all have our cultures, you know, and, and different cultures see things differently. And so from from one part of the force. It was like, well, looks like air superiority is not going to happen anymore, so we're going to have to get used to fighting without it. I took the opposite lesson. I took the lesson that this is what happens if you don't get air superiority. Is that what we want, sort of World War I, 21st century style? Uh, so to me, it shows that air power is still just as important as ever. But as we talk about, can we expect to uh, attain air superiority in the same way as before, or is there going to be this sort of similar type of, of pulsed and synchronized in order for effect uh, type of air superiority that needs to happen in, a, in an environment that is increasingly crackling with electronic warfare in the way it didn't two years ago, but it is now. Uh, I think it's, it shows that we have to continue to adapt our thinking on what those basic warfighting functions and capabilities with warfare are, but I think the basic the basic functions are still right. It's how we do them. We're learning about the innovation and adaptability that makes us have to be agile at the enterprise level to ensure we can still have air superiority and do all the things air power is supposed to bring. Well, I will ask one more question here, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Um, this question is, do we have enough long-range strike uh, in the FIDIP and beyond, or do we need more B-21s? <laughs> That is specific, uh, and, and, and the, the answer to the, diff, the two might be different. I think you can always use more long-range strike. I think the ability to have more flexible options uh, is there for us. The real question is, what do we mean when we say long-range strike? I just let you sit on that for a second, because does long-range strike mean that we have to have the platform that's long-range? or the munition that's long range. What, what is it about long range that we really need? So again, we have to open up the aperture and go back to the Webster's definition rather than what we always associate with long range strike. And I think, in general, the idea of having long range strike munitions effects that can go from one to another with whether in-flight target updates, the, the assurance that it's still gonna get to the target even if the target is moved, those sort of things that, that perhaps we had, a, we had sort of slough those off to the side because the platform's going to get there and then it'll be close enough to where when you actually expend the ammunition, you're still going to be able to get to the, get to the target. We have to think about it differently. So long-range strike, I, I, I would love more long I would love a lot more in the, for our Air Force. I, I certainly, you know, I understand we're under fiscal constraint, but I think we need more Air Force in, in general. So I'd take all of any of those. But we need to think about what it means to have long-range strike and how you would implement that to decide which sort of platforms or munitions would be the right mix to do that. Thank you very much for tolerating this initial round of questions. <laughs> I'm going to now turn for the next round to um, our resident audience here. And um, the culture of asking questions here uh, is for them to be questions, for them to be concise. Please identify yourself um, when you introduce your question. You will have 45 seconds to formulate that question, a minute maximum, and I will rudely interrupt you if need be uh, to const constrain the, the length of, of your question. So um, with that very welcoming introduction to asking <laughs> questions, um, who, would like to, who would like to raise a hand, please? Um, let's see. Let's start up here in the front. This person in the in the brownish jacket. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Sang Min. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. Uh, I have a question about the North Korea issue. So next week, South Korea and United States going to conduct a joint military exercise. 
They focusing on the potential North Korean nuclear threat. So I heard the U.S. forces or the joint U.S. Air Force called joint at this exercise. So is there any different, something different compared to last year exercise in terms of the uh, U.S. and South Korea joint air exercise? Well, actually, I will leave the specifics as to the comparison from last year to this year to the actual uh, command commander in, in Korea. I will say that consistently, though, our Air Force remains as committed to the alliance with, with South Korea and to maintaining peace on the peninsula. That is, a, as you know, it's a very dynamic environment. And so it's, it's, it needs to be handled uh, in a manner that is consistent uh, with our expectations, uh, with the expectations of our allies and partners. But as to the difference between that last year and this year, I couldn't say specifically. But I know we watch that very closely to ensure that we, we can ensure that we are making, making sure that alliance is strong and, and we'll defend uh, our, our interests in the region. Others, please. Okay, we have a person here in a white shirt, please. Oh, white shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Very gracious. <Excellent. laughs> Sorry. All good. Hi, uh, Michael Marr with Breaking the Fence. Um, you talked about, uh, you know, getting support from Congress for the reoptimization plan. What happens if, come end of April, there's still not an FY24 budget and the 1% sequester kicks in? What happens to, the, to your plans for reoptimization then? Yeah, I think at, at that point, you know, one would still want to see if we can continue to institute that, but we have a much larger problem there. We have a more existential almost issue if that happens because the one thing that if we do not get uh, – a budget an appropriation, even if, it, if, it's, if it's a year-long CR, if we go into that sequestered piece, um, the one thing that we really lose is time and, you know, our ability to be able to spend the precious resources on the things that we had planned on in order to keep pace. Uh, I, I think they would, to the extent that we're, it's going to require resources, it will definitely impact this because this is going to have to compete with all the other things that will now, that would have been above a cut line, that will now be below a cut line. But those that we can continue to do in a revenue-neutral manner, we still will because it's not a matter to me of this is an optional thing that we think it's a good idea to do. I just think the strategic environment compels us to do this. Otherwise, we find ourselves in a situation next year, the year after the year after that, where we fall further behind. This time to the other person in the white shirt and the, the gray sweatshirt, please. Uh, hi there. My name is Trevor. I'm a research associate at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. We do a lot of work with the acquisition community, um, especially in the SAF AQ. And I want to know what your hopes or expectations are for connecting warfighters to requirement setters, to developers, to folks in the acquisition community, especially through ICC, as, as you've described it so far. Yeah, I appreciate that question. And again, I, if given the time and opportunity, I'd be talking all day. So I didn't get a chance to really bring that up. Uh, in the overall presentation. I think this is key. Now, one of the things we learned over the past couple of years when we were developing these operational imperatives is we had this, uh, we called it healthy tension. It turned out to be just a great teamwork of operators who were looking at the concepts and then the technical folks right there with them looking at the feasibility of that and the acquisition professionals understanding the executability of that. You put all those three together and now you get a what? An enterprise solution to a capability. So by doing that at the enterprise level now, instituting that across our Air Force, the Integrated Capabilities Command will largely consist of operator-centric folks from across all of the functions into one whole Air Force force design that we're looking at in the future and testing operational concepts against that. The part that I didn't talk about today, but it's, a, it's an office within Air Force Material Command called the Integrated Development Office. That office is almost like the technical counterpart to be able to go back and forth when we're, when we're teasing out concepts and looking at potential modernization opportunities, that entity within Air Force Material Command can also look at the technical feasibility of that and also understand what the prioritized demand signal is for them to do future R&D on things, to understand these are the things that the Air Force is interested in. So it goes where right now that happens at the major command level. So you have a bunch of little ideas that are blossoming, but if they don't ever amount to something that the whole Air Force can execute, we're wasting time again. So that's another area where we've taken this idea of integrating technical acquisition and operators at, at the beginning, like we did in operational imperatives, and we're putting into the whole Air Force. I think that will enable us to move faster. Other questions? 
Um, we have a person here in a black jacket, uh, sweater, red pen. My name is Haven Tahle. I'm from the Harvard University. I'm a graduate student. Uh, my question is very simple uh, and it's short as well. I just want to know from your experience which one is much or which one is more smarter, the political leader or military military personnel, and why? I can I can answer that in, in a very political uh, <laughs> way. It, it depends on the issue. When you say smarter, I think there. Are, uh, I'll give you an example of a difference why we have to be able to come together. The the military person loves the planning because you want to get to a decision, and I want a decision. I would love to. I've got. I've given you the plans. I've given you the facts. I've give, come on with a decision because we want to execute. The political leadership appreciates that, but what the political leader really needs is decision space, is some time to see the other elements on the playing field. So we're, we really have a different playing field on which we operate. And so the understanding and the recognition that what we owe to our political leadership are options and risk, that's where our competency comes from. The political leadership, because they're elected by the American people, have the ultimate power and they give the ultimate answer, and they look at it from a different context. So I think, I, I would hope we're both smart, but uh, we just need to be competent in our different fields to be able to have a, a, a more coherent uh, national security decision-making apparatus for the country. Other questions? Um, we have a person in a gray jacket and a maroonish tie. I was hoping you'd call out the tie. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> my, my name is Jonathan Gross. Uh, my fiance's uncle is retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, so he'll be really excited to hear that I was here. Um, in, in a much less disruptive way, I'm wondering if you do have any comment on Aaron Bushnell's death. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's uh, for our Air Force, we look at this as it was, whether it was politically motivated or others, we lost one of ours. And so, you know, any suicide, whether by you know, political protest or by or resiliency issues or whatever it is, is, is a tragedy. And uh, as we're looking at whatever the rationale might be, there's standard investigation processes that go through that, and we look at that to make sure uh, we understand everything about it without invading the personal privacy. But right now, it's, we, we have about 100 or so suicides per year, and every year we try and get after how do we reduce this? And so right now where we are in that status is understanding that it has a lot of political fervor attached to it. This is just one of our airmen that we lost, and we're looking after the family. Uh, we're looking after the unit and really trying to understand, uh, you know, if there's any context behind this, from what lessons can be learned. But it's really about the individual that we lost. We lost a wingman. We have a person in a blue jacket and uh, lavender shirt. Thank you, uh, Chris Gordon, Air and Space Forces Magazine. Um, there are a lot of, uh, as you mentioned, sir, the concepts of um, what to learn about air superiority from Ukraine. Uh, you talked about the idea of pulsed air superiority. How does that differ from denial? Um, because presumably if pulse doesn't mean all the time. So um, I, how do you view that? I mean, is, the, is this the ability to operate freely or contested? Um, how would you de define more fully the, the pulse concept there? I, I think in general, it, it, it's a, it, the, that concept means you, you are taking air superiority and you are aligning it with the other uh, joint and combined effects. So if one had, because you don't have air superiority just to have air superiority. It's to enable other joint war fighting objectives. And so having that in conjunction with what you're trying to do, whether it be in space or to subsurface, if there are other elements in order to achieve larger campaign objectives, it's a shift from saying, first we do, we establish and maintain air superiority so we don't have to worry about that and we can, we can do the rest of our operations within that whenever and forever. Now it is because of the cost imposition on us to do that all the time and, and, and the fact that it, it becomes more challenging and we don't have to. It's just about synchronizing. It's the same thing to have air superiority to enable those others, those other effects in, in joint warfighting, but they don't have to be all the time. So it's really just about better synchronizing. 
Uh, n- denial is almost a different concept. We can deny them the air. They can deny us the air. The idea of if, if we intend to do operations from an area in which they are intending to deny us, then the way we beat that denial is to be able to have a more effective post operation to where we can apply mass and apply superiority in a way that can overcome whatever they have in that given space, in that given time, for that certain effect, but doesn't have to sustain beyond that. We'll do one more question. All right, we have a person in a white shirt and like a periwinkle tie. Periwinkle, I like that. I reached for that one. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for coming. Uh, John Brown from a startup called Poncho. You, you mentioned earlier the focus on readiness and agility. Could you speak to how does some of the quality of life issues or financial readiness, some of these other issues play into enabling that concept? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one for the last question <laughs> because it does. It, 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 it's a broad uh, landscape there. You know, we also always find ourselves, uh, we're struggling between two extremes here, right? So at the one extreme, I want, we want our airmen to have the very best equipment, the most lethal that they possibly can. But if we spend all the money on that and have them living in squalor, that's not really holding true to them or their families. And, and so we're not going to keep those airmen. On the other hand, if, you, if we give them everything we can and they live in the lap of luxury, the max extent possible, but we send them in a battle with bats and sticks, and that's not doing the country any good either. So trying to find that balance. I, I like the fact that you also you said about sort of financial, financial education. So one of the things that's been coming up recently is having to do with economic security and, and, and the, the sort of the rapid inflation that, that the, the institution wasn't ready for because we had sort of a steady, steady economy. And then this ability to adapt to these massive macroeconomic changes is, is a little bit challenged. So we are looking at Everything from the, the, the part that the Department of Defense is doing with the basic needs allowance for those at the very bottom that are 130 to 150% of the poverty level to ensure that we are accounting for them, uh, which is a very small number, but for that small number it's significant to be able to, to, to account for uh, some of the uh, economic challenges they're having. Sometimes it's about financial management education, and so reinvigorating within our military and family readiness centers that education on how to how to deal with you know, making the, the ends meet at tough times to educate us because that's what's really going to help us for the long term, not just you know, giving them a fish but teaching them to fish as well. So it's, it's a combination of both of those, but you make the right point that if, if folks are focusing on where their next meal is, it's going to be hard to, to get their readiness. So it, it, is a, it is a mix, but it's one of those where I think we, we can go into our toolkit and find that we have more tools available rather than just a dollar or nothing. Well, thank you all for those questions. And General, before we um, close for the morning, um, if there's something that we haven't accessed yet in the conversation that you, you'd like to raise, um, please feel free to take a moment uh, now. <laughs> I, I challenge myself to take only a moment because there's so many others, for example, the, the details about the Integrated Capability Command or the other things going on in Air Force Materiel Command or how we're now taking our readiness exercises from small <laughs> unit exercises to actually more of a large scale so we can see where the holes in our swing are. The, all these things, everything we are doing, when we developed what we were going to do in this great power competition, those attributes that I talked about, when we talked about if we're going to make these changes, the attributes that we are, want to achieve, organizational alignment, agility and adaptability, mission over function, enterprise solutions, all these sort of things, when we, when we contemplated these, we had those attributes up there. And we assessed them against that and said, does this help us in any of these areas or not? So we feel very confident in the general direction. But I would leave you with this. Two things. First of all, we don't have the final answers, and that's okay. But we feel very confident in the direction that we're going. And we believe that this journey is not going to be able to happen on our own. We do not intend it to be fiscally overburdening. But it's going to require teamwork, and that's what we're committed to, having the dialogue, moving forward. Because if, if, if the case for change isn't compelling, then we've lost it. But if the case for change is compelling, then it's not about should I get off the X. It's which direction should I go, and we're happy to have that conversation. That's part one. Part two, I'll close how I open. I do believe this is a time of consequence. We may not see it because there's distractions and there's complexity in the environment right now. But we've had that before, and those who are able to pierce the fog, to look through that and be able to see into the future with some courage 
and make the bold decisions now in this time of consequence, we'll look back in the future and look back at ourselves this time and be, be proud. And that's what I want to be. And I think that's, that's what our Air Force uh, is seeking to be, and that's what the nation expects of us. And so thanks for your time. Thanks for your questions. This has been great. This is going to be part of an ongoing dialogue, I hope, and, and something I'd love to come back in a couple years or maybe even less. And they go, how did it go? How is it going? Because I think it's a, it's a journey. Well, that's wonderful. You basically read my mind. Um, insofar as we're really very grateful to, that you would come and continue to invest in educating the public about the important work that's underway in the United States Air Force. And we certainly at Brookings hope very much that you'll come back and keep us up to date on your progress. Um, it's also very clear that you deeply value team. Um, and so uh, many thanks on behalf of, I hope you don't mind if I say, for both of us to your team and to the Brookings team for making today's visit possible and to the community um, for your interest and time. And we'll hope to see you back in the future. If those of you here in the room could please stay in your seats so that the general can get where he needs to go and keep to schedule, um, we'll both appreciate it. But as, as he departs, please do join me in expressing appreciation for his time and thoughts today. Thank you.